Well, who had the legal claim to represent God? If the keys of the priesthood remained with Brigham Young, the spiritualist Godbeites didn't have a leg to stand on. Fully conversant with the statements of the Godbeite leaders and their refusal to recant, Cannon was the prosecutor at the High Council trial held in October of 1869. In 1877, you'll remember, Brigham Young died. Immediately, some pent-up resentments were uncorked even among a, a small number of general authorities, grumbling and complaining about Brigham Young's uh, firm leadership. <laughs> Cannon refused to participate in this grumbling. Here's what he wrote in his diary. <clears throat> The thought was ever with me was, if I criticize or find fault with or judge Brother Brigham, how far shall I go? If I commence, where shall I stop? I dared not trust myself on such a course. I knew that apostasy frequently resulted from the indulgence of the spirit of criticizing and fault finding. Three years later, Apostle John Taylor was sustained as president of the church, and he selected George Q. Cannon as his first counselor. For the remaining 21 years of his life, Cannon would express his underlying philosophy of the great danger of apostatizing from the church and kingdom of God, betraying sacred covenants, following the ways of the world. <clears throat> When President John Taylor died in 1887, the question of succession again raised its head. During Taylor's final illness, Cannon, his first counselor, had taken much responsibility. Following Taylor's death, Cannon was once again became a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Younger apostles criticized Cannon. When Wilfred Woodruff became church president in April 1889, he promptly renamed Cannon his first counselor, but the hostility of a few people toward him did not entirely disappear. So we're up into the 1890s now. George Q. Cannon should have died at that point and his biography would have been much easier to write, but he lived on for 11 more years. And the 1890s bring new threats and stresses and strains to the unity of the church. The Woodruff Manifesto of 1890 precipitated opposition, both from monogamists who felt it was not sufficiently rigorous, and from intransigent polygamists who continued unlawful cohabitation with their plural wives. The Depression of 1893 produced a financial crisis in the church and with church-owned businesses. And it was easy to blame the First Presidency. And Cannon, who was already disliked by some people, became an easy target. Finally, this was the time when the new political alignments occasioned by the organization of national parties in Utah led to intemperate statements on both sides and jibes against the First Presidency. So it was in the fall of 1896, you'll remember, with political issues in the air, Utah had just become a state, and a political manifesto is read aloud at the General Conference of April of that year, which had to do with the necessity of general authorities obtaining permission of the church before they ran for political office. This referred to pol those who were considered to be full-time uh, leaders of the church, the general authorities. Alone of the twelve, Moses Thatcher refused to sign the political manifesto, and uh, some thaw, saw Thatcher's refusal as a courageous act of independence. And of course, you see that carries the implication that the other apostles were submissive sheep just going along with something needlessly. What I'm saying is there were many issues, many reasons, that were brought forth to account for and explain grumbling and complaining, going into activity, leaving the church, 
And with all of this taking place, and with all of these firsthand experiences, George Q. Cannon naturally is led to say something about the subject. And he gives not just one talk, over and over again in private correspondence and in talks that he gives at general conference and at state conferences, he comes back again and again to this subject. I think we can say that for George Q. Cannon, we're now in part two, individual apostasy was a result of the following four things, either separately or acting together. Number one, associating with anti-Mormons or disloyal Mormons. The man who will use his influence against my brethren is not my friend, he said in 1881. I have no fellowship with him. He may talk very nice and profess great friendship, but he is not my friend if he is opposed to my brethren and the work of God. There is no sympathy in common between us. We do not stand upon the same platform. He, he warned the people against associating, spending their time with those who were talking against the church. He warned the people against allowing their children to marry the children of apostates. Now we need to re recognize the historical context just a little bit here. Evangelical Protestants were establishing schools in Utah Territory and seeking to attract Mormon students and basing their appeal on the, for the donations that they would raise in the eastern states on the prospect of transforming Mormonism. Donate to us and we will establish these schools. Mormon children will come in and they will never again be loyal to their church. So some of George Q. Cannon's statements have to be considered against the background of that kind of opposition. Cannon enunciated the principle that one could not be a loyal member of the church and at the same time uphold those who opposed it and its leaders. He was not denouncing all non-Mormons, but those who spoke out against the church and actively worked against it. Those I think we now often refer to as anti-Mormons. <clears throat> Secondly, as he looked at Ac actions that were threatening and very often led to apostasy. He mentioned reading anti-Mormon writings. And I'd like to look at this somewhat carefully. One of Cannon's perennial concerns as a general superintendent of the Church of Sunday Schools was the inculcation of good values in the young. The big threat was cheap fiction, either in the form of paperback dime novels or serialized stories. Such reading was a waste of time, as far as he was concerned. You didn't learn anything useful. Worse, you became emotionally involved with sentimental love stories that distracted from having the Spirit of God. Reading anti-Mormon books and articles was simply a specific form of reading that would produce no good result and probably negative results. Cannon warns against what he calls a lying spirit. Men who tell lies, men who circulate lies, and men who believe lies cannot have the Spirit of God reigning in their hearts, he said. Well, the practical conclusion is you just stay away from such people and such writings. Quoting him, newspapers, magazines, and books which contain lies and which slander and defame the work and the people of God, I will not read. I do not want to read falsehood. I do not want my children to read falsehood. I have heard people say many times, let us hear what they say about us. And they read works filled with misrepresentations of the work of God. Did you ever read such a work without the Spirit of God being grieved within you? I never did. Canon cited as an example, Amos Lyman, Apostle Lyman, who for many years read spiritualist works and neglected the scriptures. It was not a solitary case. No, far from this being one alone, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands like it, Cannon says. Here he states a principle of broad application. The minds of the people 
are colored by that which they hear and read, especially if they make it a pleasure to hear and read.